exactly what religion didn't manage to do and anthropology didn't quite bring off. It can tell you why these people are, do not belong in the same camp, why they are very different from one another, why they really are a different species. And wouldn't it be good to know that instead of you know, trying to work out you know, whether the ones who are your friends are sort of closer to you than the ones who are not, you know, all that complicated map of alliances, etc., which constitute human relations, wouldn't it be good if you just had something simple which said, I'll just pop into the lab and I'll tell you whether they are or not. And that's what it'll do. Science has a function, a cultural function in our society. Let, let me, you know, pause before I get carried away. I'm not suggesting that there's nothing to science. It's not my business today. I'm talking about the function which science performs within human cultural systems. I'm talking about the cultural function of science. And I'm saying that the cultural function of science in the languages and discourses of racism have been to provide precisely that guarantee and certainty of absolute difference which no other systems of knowledge up until that point have been able to provide. And that is why the scientific trace remains such a remarkably powerful instrument in human thinking, not only in the academy, but everywhere in people's ordinary common sense discourse. For centuries, the struggle was to establish a binary distinction between two kinds of people. But what you get to the Enlightenment, which says or recognizes everybody is one species, then you have to begin to find a way which marks the difference inside the species. It's now not two species, but how, why one bit of the species is different, more barbarous, more backward, more civilized than another part. And you get into a different marking of difference. The difference that is marked inside the system. You know, I mean, listen to the way in which um, Edmund Burke once wrote to Robertson in 1777. We need no longer go to history, he says, to trace the knowledge of human nature in all its stages and periods. Why? Because now the great map of mankind is unrolled all at once. And there's no state or gradation of barbarism and no mode of refinement which we do not have at the same instant under our view. That is the panoptic glance of the Enlightenment. Everything, all of human creation, is now, as it were, under the, the, the eye of science. And within that can be marked the differences that very, ma very much matter. And what are they? The very different civility of Europe and of China, the barbarism of Tartary and of Arabia, and the savage state of North America and New Zealand. The point I'm making is that it is not science as such, but whatever is in the discourse of a culture which grounds the truth about human diversity, which unlocks the secret of the relations between nature and culture, which unties the puzzling fact of human difference which matters. What matters is not that they contain the scientific truth about difference, but that they function foundationally in the discourse of racial difference. They fix and secure what else otherwise cannot be fixed or secured. They warrant and guarantee the truth of differences which they discursively construct. The relationship here then is that culture is made to follow on from nature to lean for, on it for its justification. Exactly nature and culture here operate as, met, as metaphors for one another. They operate metonymically. It is the function of the discourse and of race as a signifier to make these two systems, nature and culture, correspond with one another in such a way that it is possible to read off the one against the other. So that once you know where the person fits in the classification of natural human races, 
you can infer from that what they're likely to think, what they're likely to feel, what they're likely to produce, the aesthetic quality of their productions, and so on. It is constituting a system of equivalences between nature and culture, which is the function of race as a signifier. The biological trace, in my view, as a discursive system is required so long as this essentializing, naturalizing function, this way of, as it were, taking racial difference out of history, out of culture, and locating it, as it were, beyond the reach of change, so long as that function is part of what racial systems are about. However, this is not the only reason, in my view, why biological uh, reasoning, while functioning, as it were, uh, as if it's largely untrue, but still somehow hangs around in the conversation which we conduct around race. That's not the only reason why that is so. What Du Bois started with was precisely the grosser physical differences of color, hair, and bone, which despite the fact that they remain anomalous to actual populations, that they transcend scientific definition, they are what finally, when we come down to it, provides the foundation for the languages of race that we speak every day. The stubborn, gross, physical facts of color, hair, or bone. Now, the central fact about these gross physical differences is not, of course, that they're based on genetic differentiation, but that they are clearly visible to the eye. They're absolutely and obviously and uncontrovertibly there. They are the visible difference. They are what it palpably to the untutored, unscientific eye makes race a thing we can continue to talk about. They are, in a sense, beyond dispute. They are brute, physical, biological facts about human vision that appear in the field of vision where seeing is believing. When Franz Fanon in uh, Black Skin, White Mask, who, as you know, was transfixed by this inscription of racial difference on the surface of the black body itself, what he called the dark and unarguable evidence of his own blackness, I am the slave, he said, not of an idea that others have of me, but of my own appearance. I am fixed by it. Well, what indeed, of course, what can people be transfixed by other than that which is so palpably, evidentially, concrete, undeniable there? A racial difference which writes itself indelibly on the script of the body. And yet I want to argue even here that the play of its signifiers are at work. What gives rise to these evident and visible signs of racial difference, fuzzy hair, big noses, thick lips, large behinds, and as the French writer Michel Cournot once delicately put it, penises as big as cathedrals, what gives rise to all that is, of course, the genetic code. I mean, it's not just that those things are there, because I don't know whether you've ever, you know, really conducted the experiment and try to actually sort out a palpable group of people who contain some of these differences, you know, carefully and discreetly into two opposing groups, it just simply can't be done. Just simply can't be done. You, you can get some people over there and a few people over there, and then there are all those wishy-washy things in the middle that keep slipping and sliding from inside to outside. It's just not possible quite to fix it. So, actually, though race is clearly what you can see. What fixes it is because we all know, we scientific folks, that behind these is the genetic code, which regrettably you can't see, but which you can infer from the fact that some people have large behinds, and some people have fuzzy hair, and some people have big noses, and some people, for all I know, have penises as big as a cathedral. But, you know, you can't set about organizing the population 
You know, you can't say, drop your pants and I'll tell you whether you're this or that. You know, because you ju the thing is just too anomalous for that. But you can be sure that genetically, some, some code has actually given, at the level of the surface of appearances,